Gear Patrol calls their new dive watch the best sub $500 dive watch. Full stop. Men's Health rated them as the most stylish solar watch in the game. Who are we talking about? It's movement. They're leveling up your gift giving with the sleekest watches you can buy and the biggest deals of the season. From their innovative ceramic materials to sexy automatic divers, from ultra thin dress watches to solar powered statement pieces and everything in between, movement is making sure you're the good gifter this year for your family, your friends, or for yourself. And now you can take advantage of 30 to 50% off Movement's California clean watches, jewelry, and accessories to get them a gift they'll never forget. With fast free shipping and returns and amazing bang for your buck, Movement makes for a relaxed shopping experience. And with one-size-fits-all watches, it's an easy, elegant gifting experience too. Shop 30 to 50% off now at MVMT.com. That's M-V-M-T. Com. This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 66, for broadcast on the 22nd of August, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, it looks like ultra-bright early galaxies may be less common than we think. The early opaque universe linked to relatively few galaxies. And a mysterious interstellar rogue planet could be a brown dwarf. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered that one of the brightest galaxies in the distant universe isn't actually that far away after all. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, has profound implications for models of how galaxies formed when the universe was still in its infancy. The study's lead author, Associate Professor Michaela Tranti from the University of Melbourne, says the discovery suggests that ultra-bright galaxies in the early universe may be less common than originally thought. Tranti and colleagues made the discovery while using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope as part of the brightest of reionizing galaxies, or Borg, survey. The Borg survey is designed to find bright galaxies using Hubble's ability to use multiple cameras at once. The authors were studying two galaxies, thought to be more than 13 billion light years away, thereby providing a glimpse of what the universe looked like when it was less than a billion years old. They found that while one of these galaxies was every bit as ancient as it looked, the other was in reality much closer, simply mistaken for one far away due to its red colour. The effect gives distinct galaxies distinct colours that can indicate how far away they are. The problem is some relatively nearby galaxies can have deceptively similar colours, lending some uncertainty to their estimated distance. Tranti says that while another camera was in use, the Borg team used Hubble's highly sensitive wide-field camera 3 in order to observe a random patch of sky for several hours. By repeating this procedure a hundred times, the Borg team were able to build up a rich data set which covers unrelated parts of the universe, maximising their chances of detecting a rare bright galaxy from the early cosmos. The two galaxies in this study were first observed as part of the Borg survey in 2016. The new study used Hubble to re-examine both galaxies in order to make a more detailed measurement of their colours so as to refine their estimated distances. One did indeed turn out to be 13 billion years old, dating back to a time when the universe was just 5% of its current age. This galaxy was incredibly bright compared to its peers, making it a perfect target for further study, allowing astronomers to better understand the evolution of galaxies in the early history of the universe. However, the second galaxy, originally thought to be the brightest galaxy ever discovered in the first 650 million years after the Big Bang, instead turned out to be a galactic imposter. Tranti says the galaxy was just 9 billion light years away. Not a bad distance, but nothing compared to the 13 billion originally thought. Why do we want to look for ultra-bright galaxies in the distant universe? What does that tell us? What does it tell us? That's an excellent question. Well, it tells us some really valuable information about how the first generations of stars and galaxies formed in the early epochs in the history of the universe. So we are talking about the first uh, seven, eight hundred million years, so more than 13 billion years ago, and how these uh, 
galaxies then shape the cosmos uh, in which we live today. And why ultra bright? It's because uh, since they are the easiest to spot, the sources are so distant that it's really, really challenging to find them, even with a telescope as powerful as uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. The brighter the sources, the better our chances of not only finding them, but also to be able to collect enough light, enough photons uh, to characterize uh, at least some of their properties. This is an epoch in cosmic history known as reionization. This is when those first stars and galaxies galaxies began ionizing the hydrogen around them and space began becoming transparent as it expanded. Yeah, yeah, no, transparent to the high energy photons that are produced by the young stars. Yes, absolutely. It's an exciting era in the history of the universe because we have the first light sources, the first stars, the first galaxies that are formed. The universe at the beginning was pretty boring place, uh, homogeneous, made out of only of uh, hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, but uh, it was missing all the heavier chemical elements. And it was also full of those hydrogen atoms in a neutral state. So as the first stars and the first galaxies were formed out of the tiny density perturbations that were imprinted at the birth of the universe, and then they, they grew through gravity's fatal attraction over time, we have the production of heavier chemical elements created in the furnaces inside stars. And as those stars exploded supernovae, the universe becomes more complex. We have more stars, more galaxies being formed as time passes. And those light sources, yes, they are transforming the universe also because they produce high energy photons, get absorbed by the hydrogen atoms, and the atoms get ionized. Characterizing properties of the first galaxies uh, helps us understand how this uh, ionization process uh, occurs. In this respect, the brightest galaxies, uh, because they are uh, easier to spot, but they are also very, very rare because of their rarity, we do not think that they are contributing significantly to the process of cosmic ionization or reionization, but rather uh, it will be their uh, fainter uh, but much more abundant siblings uh, that uh, are doing most of the work in uh, ionizing hydrogen atoms. But when you looked at these early bright galaxies, you discovered some of them may not have been quite as early as originally thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's very, very interesting. And we're getting a little bit more in the, into the technical details of how these uh, distant galaxies are discovered. So ideally, astronomers would love to measure uh, the distance to the galaxies very, very precisely and be very confident uh, about the objects that we can uh, observe. But to do so, we need to take a spectra of the, of the galaxies uh, to measure exactly the frequency of each photon that arrives uh, in, and is collected in uh, our uh, telescopes. That's unfortunately beyond essentially the current capabilities, except in a very, very handful of selected cases. So when we search for these distant galaxies, we do the next best thing. We, instead of having a full spectrum, we rely on the colors of the galaxies. And in general, we have seen that red uh, sources, uh, those uh, are the, uh, very far away uh, from us. Their light uh, traveled for billions of years to reach us. Uh, and because of the expansion of the universe, the wavelength has been shifted more toward the red. So we use uh, colors uh, to measure the uh, approximate uh, distance redshift. And so we have uh, strictly speaking, candidate galaxies uh, observed at these very early epochs uh, rather than spectroscopically confirmed galaxies. And what we have done here in uh, our recent study led by the Australian Research Council DECRA fellow, Dr. Rachel Livermore here at the University of Melbourne, we have taken some new images with the Hubble 
Hubble Space Telescope to characterize better the colors of these ultra bright galaxies. We found that like one has been confirmed to still have colors that are as expected for one galaxy during the epoch of ionization, while the other turn out to be an impostor, like the colors with new observations are a little bit too bluish, and so that means that the galaxy was not as far away as we thought initially. So what's the story with this other galaxy? Is it that there's just more dust between us and it, or is it that its stars are simply lots of M dwarfs and things like that? Or I think it might be a combination of dust in that galaxy, unusual properties of the stars that live in it. Uh, that's a little bit of a mystery to understand better what are the properties of these impostor galaxies that are contained contaminating the purity of our uh, color selection for the distant galaxies. Could you tell what type it was, whether it was spiral or uh, irregular or, or whatever? Uh, they are very compact. You can see it from the image. Uh, so we don't quite have uh, morphological information. We know it's an extended source, but we don't know what, what exactly yeah. it is. It is. Uh, I would guess because of the colors that are still relatively, uh, they are not as red as we were expecting, but they are red, that uh, it's probably some dwarf elliptical galaxy with uh, unusual amount of dust in it. That's uh, just my personal guess. The name, the, um, the brightest galaxy of... The brightest, the brightest of reunizing galaxies uh, survey, yeah, yeah Borg. I, I love the name of that, Borg. Uh, are you a Star Trek yeah. fan? Yeah, I am. And uh, didn't see any cubes and our, or anything with yeah, any, any cubes and you know our logo because uh, Borg is a survey that collects uh, multiple images uh, mm. uh, along uh, random patches, uh, uh, random positions in the sky. Uh, we even have a logo which is uh, a data cube oh, really? <laughs> with many images stuck together to create something that might remind a Star Trek fan of a Borg. That's Michaela Tratty from the University of Melbourne. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered that the most opaque place in the universe 12.5 billion years ago contained relatively little matter. The findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal may eventually shed light on another phase of cosmic history. The large-scale structure of the universe comprises a web-like structure of thin filaments of dark matter, plasma, stars and galaxies, connected to giant nodes of galaxy clusters and superclusters, all of which surround vast regions of near-empty voids. Today, the intergalactic gas in these filaments and connecting nodes is almost transparent. That's because it's kept ionised by an energetic bath of ultraviolet radiation from stars. However, back in the distant past, roughly 12.5 billion years ago, just a billion years or so after the Big Bang, the transparency of this gas varied widely from place to place across the cosmos. To find out what created these differences, astronomers used the Subaru telescope to look for galaxies where intergalactic gas was known to be extremely opaque. Generally speaking, for the cosmic web, more opacity usually means more gas, and hence more galaxies. But when they looked in this one region, the team found the opposite. The region contained far fewer galaxies than average. Because gas in deep space is kept transparent by the ultraviolet light from the stars in galaxies, fewer galaxies nearby might make it murkier. The study's lead author, Assistant Professor George Becker from the University of California, Riverside, says that normally it doesn't matter how many galaxies are nearby, because the ultraviolet light keeping gas ionised in deep space, therefore keeping it transparent, often comes from galaxies extremely far away. But it seems during this early epoch, the ultraviolet light can't travel very far. And so, a patch of the universe with fewer galaxies in it will tend to look much darker than one with plenty of galaxies around. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time.
Astronomers have discovered a mysterious object in interstellar space which appears to be right at the boundary between what scientists would consider to be a giant planet and what would be considered a brown dwarf. The object, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, is over a dozen times more massive than Jupiter and has a surprisingly strong magnetic signature. And also, it's a rogue, travelling alone through space without a host star. The authors detected this mysterious object using the National Science Foundation's Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array, the first ever radio telescope detection of a planetary mass object beyond our solar system. The study's lead author, Melody Kayo from Caltech, says this object's providing some surprises that could potentially help science understand magnetic processes both on stars and planets. Brown dwarfs are failed stars. They're objects which didn't accumulate enough mass to sustain the core nuclear fusion process which makes stars shine. Instead, they fill the gap between the largest planets and the smaller stars. As a rule, brown dwarfs are thought to have diameters about the same as that of Jupiter, and they have between 13 and 65 times Jupiter's mass. Or to put that another way, about 0.08 solar masses. That 0.08 solar mass figure is pretty important, because anything smaller than that can't fuse normal hydrogen. However, brown dwarfs can fuse another form of hydrogen called deuterium, and they can also fuse lithium. Some high-mass brown dwarfs are thought to start out their lives as spectral type M red dwarf stars. However, if they're close enough to the low-end mass spectrum for red dwarfs, they can lose enough mass during their evolution to cease core hydrogen fusion, turning them from red dwarfs into brown dwarfs. Theorists first postulated the existence of brown dwarfs back in the 1960s. However, it wasn't until 1995 that the first was discovered. Originally, it was thought that brown dwarfs didn't emit radio waves. But in 2001, astronomers using the Very Large Array discovered radio flaring in a brown dwarf, indicating strong magnetic activity. Subsequent observations have shown that some brown dwarfs do indeed have strong aurora, similar to those seen on our own solar system's gas giants. Of course, the aurora seen on Earth are caused by our planet's magnetic field interacting with the sun's solar wind. And that's where there's a bit of a problem. You see, a solitary brown dwarf such as this one wouldn't have a solar wind from a nearby star to interact with. Exactly how aurora caused on brown dwarfs is therefore unclear. One possibility is an orbiting exoplanet or exomoon interacting with the brown dwarf's magnetic field. We know this can happen because we've seen it take place between Jupiter and its volcanic moon Io. The object was originally detected in 2016 as one of five brown dwarfs the scientists were studying with a very large array to gain new knowledge about magnetic fields and the mechanisms by which some of these coolest stellar-like objects can produce strong radio emissions. Brown dwarf masses are notoriously difficult to measure and at the time of its discovery, this object was thought to be a much older, more massive brown dwarf. Last year, another group of scientists suggested that it may have been part of a young group of stars. The object, which has been named SIMP J01365663 plus 0933473, is about 200 million years old and about 20 light years from Earth. The determination that it's so young means it's in fact far less massive than originally estimated, leading to the likelihood that rather than being a brown dwarf, it's a free-floating rogue planet, with a mass of about 12.7 times that of Jupiter and a radius about a quarter larger than Jupiter. Astronomers have also determined its surface temperature to be about 825 degrees Celsius. Now, as you may have guessed from this story, the exact difference between what's a giant planet and what's a brown dwarf remains somewhat hotly debated among astronomers. But one rule of thumb astronomers use is the 13 Jovian mass rule, below which deuterium fusion ceases, known as the deuterium burning limit. So at 12.7 times the mass of Jupiter, this is definitely a planet, not a brown dwarf. Meanwhile, the Caltech team who originally detected its radio emissions back in 2016 have now undertaken new observations at higher radio frequencies, showing that its magnetic field is even stronger than initially measured. And that presents a new problem, because such a strong magnetic field presents huge challenges for science's understanding of the dynamo mechanism which produces magnetic fields both in brown dwarfs and exoplanets, and to help to drive the aurora being observed. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
Gold Coast-based space startup Gilmore Space Technologies has conducted its most powerful orbital engine test so far, achieving some 80 kilonewtons or 18,000 pounds of thrust during a 17-second burn of its experimental hybrid rocket engine. The successful test at their Westmire site in rural Queensland sets the stage for a suborbital launch later this year, with the first orbital test flights now expected in 2020. Company CEO Adam Gilmore says the record engine burn was the final pre-flight motor test of their main orbital engine. The company is one of a growing number of space startups racing to develop small low-cost commercial launch vehicles that could deliver the next generation of small satellites into low Earth orbits. Gilmore plans to launch its Ares 100 three-stage rocket in 2020. The Ares 100 is designed to carry 100 kilograms of payload into low Earth orbit. That will be followed in 2021 by a test flight of the larger Ares 400, a clustered engine launch vehicle capable of carrying payloads of up to 400 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Gilmore's hybrid rocket engine technology uses a mixture of solid and liquid fueled propellants. The hybrid engine combines the higher thrust output of solid rocket motors with the increased throttle controllability of liquid fueled rockets, and without the liquid fueled rocket complexities of cryogenic fuel storage and expensive turbopump systems to provide sufficient combustion chamber pressure. Meanwhile, New Zealand's space launch company Rocket Lab have delayed their next orbital test flight until November because of technical issues. The Auckland-based company says ongoing concerns with their electron launch vehicle motor controllers are behind the delays. The company scrubbed planned launches in April and June because of the problem. Rocket Lab successfully launched four satellites into orbit aboard its electron rocket during a test flight in January from its Mahia Peninsula launch pad near Gisborne. The company says if all goes well, the November launch will be followed by another in December, with plans to eventually launch payloads from New Zealand at least monthly. And it could get a lot more busy than that, with the Mahia Peninsula Launch Complex licensed to launch rockets every 72 hours. In fact, the manifest could get so busy, Rocket Labs are now looking at developing a launch facility in the United States in order to meet the growing US market demand for small launch payload services. And as part of this endeavour, Rocket Labs is now scaling up production of its carbon fibre electron rockets, targeting a production rate of one new rocket per month. The Electron is an expendable two- or three-stage orbital launch vehicle designed to place small 225kg payloads into low Earth orbit. The Electron is powered by liquid oxygen and RP-1 kerosene fueled Rutherford rocket engines, which are the first electric pump-fed engines to power an orbital rocket. The 17-metre-tall Electron uses nine Rutherford engines burning for 303 seconds on its first stage and a single Rutherford engine powering the second stage for 333 seconds. The optional third stage uses a monopropellant powered Curie liquid fueled engine as a kick motor. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A novel new drug's being touted as a major step forward in the battle against escalating rates of obesity and associated metabolic diseases. In countries like Australia and the United States, two out of every three adults are now classified as overweight or obese. A report in the journal Nature Communications claims long-term studies between researchers at the Centenary Institute and the University of New South Wales has led to the creation of a drug which targets an enzyme linked to insulin resistance, a key contributor to metabolic diseases such as type 2 diabetes. A new study has found that Australians are living longer, with women now living around 85.5 years, while men on average make it to 81 and a half years. The findings reported in the British Medical Journal looked at life expectancy in 18 high-income countries. It seems Australia made life expectancy gains from 2010 all the way through to 2016, while most countries saw a dip during 2014 and 2015, which the authors say was likely related to the especially severe influenza season. However, while other countries bounced back, life expectancy in the United States and the United Kingdom continued to decline in 2016, which the researchers say raises questions about future trends in these countries. Both British women and British men have seen their life expectancy tip to 82.7 years and 79 years respectively, while in the United States, women now live for an average of 81.4 years and men for just 76.4 years. Overall, the top five countries for life expectancy for women were Japan, where the ladies lived to an average age of 87.2 years, followed by Spain with 85.8, France at 85.5, 
Australia at 85.46 and Switzerland at 85.4. The top five countries for average life expectancy for men play Switzerland first at 81.6 years, just ahead of Australia at 81.5, Japan spot on 81 years, Norway 80.6, with Sweden in fifth place at 80.57. A new study has concluded that tiny 3.4 billion year old fossils discovered in Western Australia's Strelly Pool formation are chemically similar to modern bacteria. The findings all but confirm the biological origins of the fossils located about 1500 kilometres from Perth and ranks them among the oldest in the world. The research, reported in the journal Geochemical Perspective Letters, shows that the chemical residuals of these ancient fossils match those of younger bacterial fossils and are also likely to have been laid down by even earlier life forms. A solid white mass found in an ancient Egyptian tomb dating back to the 13th century BCE may be the world's oldest cheese. The tomb of Tams, mayor of Memphis in Egypt during the 13th century BCE, was initially unearthed in 1885. After being lost under drifting sands for over a century, it was rediscovered in 2010, and archaeologists found broken jars at the site a few years later. A report of the journal Analytical Chemistry claims the cheese was found in a jar alongside a canvas fabric, which may have been used to preserve its contents. The white mass was found to be a dairy product containing proteins from cow's milk and either sheep or goat milk. And while most people love an aged cheese, it turns out this one may not be any gouda as scientists have also found evidence of a potentially deadly brucellosis bacteria in the sample. Well, it seems around a third of smartphone buyers are putting off their next cell phone purchase, preferring instead to stick with their existing phones until the new 5G models are released in the next 18 months or so. Alex Saharov royt from IT Wire says their decision will have a significant impact on smartphone sales. It's all the big hype at the moment, 5G this, 5G that, everyone's installing 5G equipment. But the 5G mobile standard hasn't yet been ratified, only the fixed 5G standard. So, you know, there might be test phones in labs that are able to deliver much faster speeds than we have with 4G today. But because of all of this hype, an Australian research firm called Telsite has said that the Australian mobile market is facing a decline as buyers are waiting for 5G phones. I mean, if you're going to be spending, you know, 1500 to up to $2,000 for a brand new smartphone, and certainly the 5G ones will command a premium, then uh, should you hang on to your existing phone for a bit longer? And so that is you know, obviously causing some uh, conniptions for the, for the phone makers and the telcos. Well, that's exactly what I said to you a couple of weeks ago, that I'm holding off until 5G becomes available. And look, when 5G does become available, it will be version 1 of 5G. There will obviously be improvements and increases, just as we saw with 3G and 4G. They had things like 3.5G and 4.5G. Vodafone in Australia even did a 4.99G uh, setup with um, you know, certain towers in certain areas as a, as a trial to deliver much faster speeds than just the, the standard 4G can deliver. So obviously we'll be seeing 5.5G and you know, the, every year you'll have uh, better and better capacities and capabilities and faster speeds and more people being uh, serviced in a particular cell than was ever possible with 4G. But the, it is a valid concern that people will say, well, I'll just use my iPhone 10 or Samsung Galaxy Note 9 or Note 8 or S7 or whatever it might be for another year. I'll put that money in my pocket. And when the latest wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, great phone appears, I'll splurge on it then. And that report by Alex Saharov royt from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 